are you guys doing? My name is Alison and in this video today or right now we're going to be introducing or I'm going to be interviewing Montrese Suarez. She owns a company called Dare to be Natural that specializes in natural hair products. So I guess hair products for the hair <laughs> and the scalp also. And the reason we've got a Montrese on is because she knows so much more than me when it comes to um, eczema on your scalp or also sets I'm going to make sure I pronounce this correctly. Seborrheic, sebo, seborrheic um, dermatitis. I hope I got that correct. So before we get started, remember to like, subscribe, share, comment, and hit the notifications so you know when the next video is coming out. And before we get started, also, I'm going to say down below in the description, you will have access to the free guides. You might also notice I'm wearing my gym gear. I've just finished teaching. And this is the only time that Montrese and I had to get together and do this interview. So you'll have to put it with my bright yellow vest. So let's get started. So I'm going to introduce the lovely Montrese Suarez. Montrese, how are you? Hi there, Alison, in your bright yellow gym <laughs> gear. <laughs> Look at all bright. I know. This is keeping it real, isn't it? <laughs> 100%. I literally got in from the dream and thought, right, I need to get this done quickly. No shower, no change in my clothes. This is me up close and in person with no makeup interviewing you because you are the guest of today's show. So um, I'm going to stop wasting your time because I want, the, I, want the, I want the viewers to learn as much as possible because I talk predominantly about um, just eczema. Um, so the actual, just the, the kind you see on the skin, the, the itchy stuff, not the, not, the, not the stuff you see on the scalp. So I do really want to educate our customers and our, our viewers right now about another type of eczema which is, so I'm going to say, literally say to you, over to you. So please introduce yourself and uh, tell us and throw all your knowledge at us as much as possible so we can cram in as much as possible into this session. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Alison, for inviting me on to your YouTube channel. Hi, Tig the Mew viewers. I hope you all are great today. Thanks for tuning in and watching this video. I hope you get some hair nuggets to take away with you. Let me quickly just share my screen now. So let me introduce myself. My name is Montrese Suarez. I started a company called Dare to Be Natural in 2019. And just a little background, this is me in 2010. This is what my hair looked like before I began my journey to honoring my natural hair. After years of relaxing and heat, it resulted in breakage and weak hair. It wasn't very nice. Um, so this picture was taken a month before my son passed away. That's the one with him in it. Um, at I had put away the heated appliances and ditched the chemical relaxers. My introduction to natural saw the, 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 my transition to natural saw the introduction of the wig. That's the bottom picture that you see. For the next year, literally, I wore that same wig um, starting late 2011, and it became my everyday wig for a whole year. This is me in 2013 when I decided that it was time to leave the state we had called home for the last 15 years and started a new life in um, a new state. I li I've been in, t in um, the US for the last 20 years. The move to a new place resulted in the death of the wig. And as a new phase in our journey began, it was also take time for me to learn how to take care of my hair post damage. YouTube, the very channel that we're on right now, became a wonderful resource in learning how to maintain my healthy hair. In 2013, I decided that it was time to leave the state we had called home for the last 15 years and start a new life in a new state. The move to the new place resulted in the death of the wig. I took that off and put it down for the last time. Hallelujah. And a new phase. <laughs> you like that, right? <laughs> so that's me. I took it off and that was my hair growth from 2011. Um, and um, as we began this journey, I, it was time for me to learn how to take care of my hair post damage. YouTube, which is the channel that we're on now, woo, for YouTube, mm -hmm. <laughs> became a welcome resource in learning how to maintain my healthy hair and also make products. It was really important to me that I made products with ingredients that were beneficial and pronounceable, easy to use, and that I could find locally. Um, I have a daughter, she was in the earlier pictures also, who has a beautiful set of head of hair. And so I wanted to make sure that she understood how that the worth of her hair and how to take care of it and what she should be putting on it. So whatever I made for myself, I also made for her. Brilliant. 
Dare to Be Natural, as I said at the intro, was born in 2019 after I attended a business course in the UK that disrupted the narrative I had about becoming a business owner. My list of why's I started my own business included my desires, my hopes, my goals, my strides, and my reward. And it has been a journey, hasn't it, friend? Oh, it has indeed. <laughs> I'll say a fun journey, but also a fun and rewarding and also difficult. <laughs> yes, yes. So when I started the company, as Alison will attest, because we are we went on a similar journey, um, I had to learn how to take the product that I had been making for myself and turn it into a formula worthy of being assessed and deemed safe to sell to the general public. Along the way, I learned how to research ingredients, which is part of the reason why we're having this uh, YouTube mm-hmm. today. And so I had to learn how to research ingredients, the reason why I wanted to use them and their benefits. In 2020, December, I started working on my Diploma of Natural Hair Care Formulation with a large skin care school based in the UK. This course has confirmed all that I've learned thus far. Now I'm learning how to formulate shampoos, conditioners and hairstyling products. So that is a little about me. Let's get right in. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get right in and talk about um, the dermatitis, but also let's let's do some scalp and hair 101 and set a foundation for what we're going to talk about. Because I think yeah, that's important if we start with a foundation and then build upon that. And so the slide that you're looking at is a image of our scalp. And so the same as skin on the rest of our bodies, the scalp skin is made up of three layers. The hypodermis contains the nerves, blood, arteries, veins, and fatty tissue that gives life to the hair bulb. The dermis holds structure that bursts the hair strand. And the epidermis is the layer that we see and interact with every day. Depending on the ingredients, which is going to be important when we have a further conversation just in a little bit. So depending on the, the ingredients, some, a certain, some compounds are small enough to penetrate to the hypodermis, stimulating blood vessels to start growing hair. So this is how our hair grows. The difference in scalp skin and the rest of the skin on our body lies with its function. So it's important that even though it's our skin is our major organ, um, the function of the scalp skin is different to the regular skin. And and it's it, and the only difference is the, the um, function. So on our scalp, the oil glands are larger and make more sebum. And so we need sebum um, to help keep our hair, to keep, I'm sorry, our scalp protected and prevent internal moisture loss and keep it healthy. And by sebum, um, our scalp skin oil is made of, I'm sorry? For the viewers, by sebum, you mean oil? It's yes. Sebum is the natural oil that our bodies produce um, on our skin to help with uh, moisture loss, but also on our hair to help protect the environment of our scalp. Our scalp skin is made up of 40% lipids, which are oils, 40% proteins and 20% water. So our hair is unique in structure. And all of this, again, is important because with the condition that we're talking about, some experience hair loss. And so also understanding the genetics of our hair, um, I believe, is important. So again, we get a foundation and we can build on, on solid understanding. So our hair is unique in structure. Different cross sections or profiles produce hair shafts that are straight, curly or slightly curly. For instance, the cross section of people from African descent is oval or elliptical in makeup, thus producing curly hair shafts. The cross section of people from Caucasian descent have profiles that are slightly elliptical, producing hair that is slightly curly, while people of Asian descent have profiles that are circular, producing straight hair. In the hair shaft itself, which is the bottom image, the, the, um, the hair shaft contains three layers. The medulla is at the center of the shaft. The cortex gives texture, color, and strength to the shaft. And finally, the cuticle is the outer layer that acts as protection for the rest of the shaft. The cuticle is the layer we interact with on a daily basis. And this layer can either be flat or raised, helping to decide if hair takes a lot of liquid to become filled with moisture or requires very little. Um, Briefly, also our hair goes through some phases of hair growth at any one time. It could be resting, um, it could be in growth, 
um, and I'll just quickly run through those. Um, the span of our, of our hair shafts, as I said, goes through multiple phases. Um, different parts of our hair may be going through different phases. The growth phase is known as the analog phase. And so depending on which phase our hair is in, um, they have different time periods and they also serve different purposes. So the analog phase, which is the growth phase, can last anywhere between one to 10 years. And it's responsible for helping our hair grow at a steady rate. The transition phase is also known as the catagen phase. It can last between four weeks to four months. And it's the time, of, time period where our hair completely stops growing. The telogen phase is the resting phase, and this can last up to four months. And, th and this phase, our hair shafts are getting ready to create new space for new hair shafts to grow. And then the final phase, which can last anywhere from four to seven months, is the shedding phase or the expogen phase. And during this phase, this is when the hair follicle detaches actually from our scalp skin and we see um, shedding. And so it's, it's important to understand when people have any kind of sensitivity on their scalp or any condition of the scalp and they see hair loss, um, there is a difference between shedding and breakage. And so I just want to touch on that. Um, if someone is washing their hair or grooming their hair and they find longer pieces of hair um, may come out, um, that's an indication of shedding, which could be um, a, a symptom of the scalp condition that we're talking about today. Um, shedding it, uh, I'm sorry, um, breakage is when we have shorter pieces of hair um, that comes out, like maybe when we brush our hair or comb our hair. And so knowing the difference between when it's actually shedding and breaking is important. And I guess breaking of the hair is when it's not good as I take it as opposed to shedding. Yeah, we don't want our hair to be breaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what we do to our hair and scalp is important. So, so now I want to talk about some of the environmental effects or so the outside things that can affect our hair. And then we'll also touch on some internal things. So when we decide to chemically treat our hair with products designed to affect the structure of our hair, whether we want it to be straight or curly, or want to change the color or for hold purposes, we're also infecting the environment of our scalp. So whatever we're putting on our hair is subsequently going. Some of the product or whatever we're putting on the hair is going to reach our scalp. So this is um, what I've, I've told the viewers that it's not just what you eat that affects your eczema. It's also the products you put on your on your body and on your scalp, I guess, and on your hair. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and to that point, products designed to achieve the goals mentioned before um, tend to have quite high pH balances between mm. 9 and 14. And so some can even be higher than that because the, the, the effect of that particular product is to make the change, whatever that change is going to be to the hair, faster and more intense. And so these um, products that have high pHs are more alkaline in a scalp environment that is naturally designed to be acidic. So our scalp environment is designed to be acidic right. and the pH range for our scalp is between four and a half and five and a half. So you can imagine anything above five and a half or like nine to 14 and we're putting that on our scalp it's going to irritate our scalp yeah and, um, and it's going to be sure you so right and and so it's the, and this is why i bring it so to mind and uh, about chemically because we exactly we don't know the ph but we now we do know that some of these um the ingredients combined in these types of products have high ph's yeah. and so it's just important to bear in mind if we're going to put something such as these items on our hair um they will um have an effect on our scalp because they're more alkaline in nature where our scalp is more acidic and so any product and again we won't know which one mm -hmm. um, but any product that is alkaline more alkaline than the in those ranges that i mentioned um, there's a greater risk to not only damaging the hair, but also our, our scalp. So you're literally causing your own dandruff or seborrheic dermatitis, aren't you, if you're using these? You're going to irritate the skin. And so we'll go in and in, uh, into more detail. But yes, you could be irritating your scalp skin enough to, to make to cause a flare up or something if someone doesn't know that the, they have a medical condition okay. or they have, you know, if there isn't something going on on the outside. Certainly would exacerbate a sensitive scalp yes. certainly would do that if if the product is left too long on the hair or their scalp is extra sensitive and so even put in a little bit on a piece of the scalp skin might irritate it for sure gotcha well i've learned the hard way again with things like this that's why i'm, I'm glad you're educating me 
<laughs> oh, and you I'm say that. Disney. <laughs> yeah, and you say that, and I remember actually. I'll tell you a little story. When I um, used to perm my hair, so I would per um, wanted to keep my hair straight. And there was always a saying that you never would irritate your scalp before you put the product on your hair because wherever you irritated or scratch your scalp, yeah. that piece of your scalp was going to um, start burning. Yes. And sure enough, like the day before, I know I wouldn't need to do that. And I would do that and I would damage my hair, yeah. my scalp every time. Um, and and you know, so you, it was said that. <laughs> you just said that. And I remember as a, as, a, as, a, as a teenager being told never to comb your hair the day before you get your hair relaxed. So. <laughs> Because you will scratch your scalp. Yeah, and this is why. Because then we put that alkaline product on that patch, uh, on our hair to straighten our hair, but inevitably some of it is going to get on our scalp. And then uh, we wonder why our scalp is like feeling fiery red. Well, mm -hmm. it's because our scalp is going, please, I don't like yeah. this. Whatever you're doing right now, I need you to stop. Mm -hmm. There are safe ways, of course. So I'm not saying that we can't put these um, products on our hair I'm just saying we should be wise to what we're doing to our hair and how chemically um, putting these kinds of products can affect our hair because there is a way probably that we can put those products on our hair safely we just need to understand how to do it safely yeah. and um, and so that's what I'm I'm hopefully conveying to the uh, viewers today and, and so just, another just to make another point because yeah People are assuming right now it's only the really harsh things like, you know, color dyes or bleaching kits or straighteners or perm kits. But I know for, I know for a fact, and I can confirm, I, this happened to me many years ago. I used a product on my hair as like an oilless hair gel. And that was my very first severe allergic reaction to a hair product, which actually put me in hospital. Um, wow. so that, was, that wasn't even a bleaching kit or a straightening, you know, a straightening kit or a perm kit. That was yeah. just something that I use for everyday use. I didn't use it before, didn't didn't check out how to use it properly. And to be honest, I don't think I used it incorrectly. It just did not suit my scalp. And I yeah. had what's called a bee sting effect. Whole face filled up, whole head filled up. And wow. for about a week and a half, I had fluid on my face to the point where it looked like I'd been somebody's punching bag. Wow. Um, and that was my very first allergic reaction to a product. And that's yeah. when I started getting all the flaky scalp and stuff for years afterwards and, and the snake-like skin when it all peeled afterwards. So people, it can happen. So listen up, because what Montrese is telling you here right now, this happens every single day to people. It's just that you don't hear about it. Yeah. And it's a great segue when we talk about it. Um, and I'm glad that you raised that because a little later on, we'll talk about ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, and so even if you don't have something chemically, like you said, you're not doing that to your hair, what kind of ingredients could be in a product that could irritate your scalp? And yeah. so whatever was in that gel at that time, if we had the jar we could look at the back of it and read it and find out possibly what may have irritated just your your, yeah. um, your scalp so i'm so glad that you mentioned that and we will cover it here in just a second <laughs> Fantastic. so as well as chemically environmentally the weather has a huge impact on our scalp and our hair pollution humidity or wet environments all factor into how our hair responds Pollution holds molecules that are small enough to sink into our hair. So think of like barbecue smoke or just regular smoke. These molecules can internally damage hair shafts. Environments that are humid can affect moisture levels of our hair as much as wet environments can cause our hair to go frizzy. And again, they will have, it will have an impact on our scalp as well. It's not just our hair. Here you go. This is your, your favorite bit. I know. <laughs> yeah, I love so much. Yes. Nutrition. So what we put into our bodies translates into how well we look after our bodies. Let me say that again. <laughs> what we put into our bodies, this is for Tigs and Moo. <laughs> what we put inside our bodies, what we eat, translates to how well we look after our body. Food high in nutritional value will be turned into compounds that help promote healthy scalps, which leads to healthy hair. On the other side of that, diets that are high in processed food groups lack the vitamins and minerals needed to create and maintain an optimal scalp environment. Health conditions can also fall into this category as our body tries to compensate for any deficiencies and exercising, it helps keep a healthy body. And it's really not funny, but I'm so glad that you came in with your gym gear because <laughs> you just finished exercising and that's yeah. a great way to help keep our body healthy. Oh, I think I'm wearing a halo right now. See that little right there. thing on the ceiling, yep. Yeah. 
So this dermatitis that we're talking about today mm -hmm. after that little instruction, I want to make sure that the readers, I'm sorry, the listeners can get a ground, um, a, a foundation in can you tell them how, to correct, how to correctly pronounce because I'm still getting it wrong. Seboraic dermatitis. There we go. Seboraic, thank you. <laughs> um, and so this reminds me again, Alison, of when we have to pronounce our inky names on our product. And just for the viewers, whenever someone creates a product, there is a particular con um, naming convention that we have to use called the inky name. And those are those really long names that no one can pronounce on the back of the bottles. And so sometimes when Alison and I are trying to um, talk about some of those names and pronounce those names we get all tongue-tied it feels yeah, like we'll this yeah we'll, we'll, we'll give it an initial yeah, yeah okay so we'll right now we'll call or this sd or some yeah. dermatitis or something <laughs> so according to the mayo clinic um seborrheic dermatitis is a condition that mainly affects the scalp it causes scaly patches for some red and some red skin and stubborn dandruff it can also affect oily areas of our body, so our faces, the sides of our nose, our eyebrows, our ears, our chest. Um, and it also can be known as dandruff, seborrheic eczema, or seborrheic psoriasis. Um, it's a little more intense than dandruff. Um, and sometimes it's, as you can see from some of these images, it's quite quite um, significant. And so um, on the screen, you'll just see some of it like on the back of the neck, some scalp conditions. And also um, it can be, it's known as cradle cap in babies. And so there's an image there of just a little bit of uh, mm. cradle cap in a baby. So what causes it? Well, mm -hmm. the co causes um, certain medical conditions can cause it, stress causes it hormonal changes can cause it or even illnesses and we talked a little bit about illnesses and the need for exercise um solvents can cause it harsh detergents can cause it chemicals soaps cold dry weather some medications um, can cause it so there's a whole bunch of concerns that can cause it and now we've gone from a little bit of external to internal as well it's a combination of them both um, there are some things that out chemically or out environmentally on the outside can cause it, but there's also some internal reasons as, as well. And, and it's important where possible to go to a dermatologist or a trichologist and get your, um, if you have a condition such as this, seek medical help um, to find out how you can, what any, if there's any lifestyle changes or any, anything that you can do to help with these um with this condition. So let's talk a little bit about prevention. And this is a, like a twofold thing, yeah, because we just said what, what causes it, and there's a great many factors that can cause it. Some are internal, some are external. Um, so when you're someone is going to a medical professional or a professional to get um, a diagnosis and then treatment. Um, you could be willing, be willing to explore the foods that are consumed, or if you decide to tackle this on your home, this is just suggested. Um, this is my just suggestions. I'm not a medical professional, so this is this is not me giving medical advice. This is me just suggesting some ideas. Um, so we could look at what you're consuming, yeah. um, your lifestyle habits, the medical conditions and the medicines, also the amount of stress someone is under. Um, if there's any way to reduce the level of stress that a person feels when they're in a particular environment, um, these this, these will help um, internally to look at the part of part of looking at the skin on the scalp. Um, externally now, not using soap or shaving cream if they irritate the skin or for like you, you had to learn the hard way, but you learned that gel yeah. or an ingredient in that gel was it was um, adverse to your um, scalp and so you learned I'm sorry the hard way when yes. you were younger but you understood that you can't put that on your hair and certainly that would have been something an ingredient in that particular product and we never um, found out which ingredient it was and we never will so yeah 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 all you could do is keep um, a particular manufacturer keep on going, right? yeah. and now that we know better we're educating exactly your 
viewers so that they also can learn and know better. Yeah, yeah. it's all a learning curve, big and steep. All learning. a learning curve. And don't we learn every day, friend? And indeed we do. <laughs> every day so again Alison said keep it real we're going to keep it real we are all on a journey together and this is part of that journey and so as we have this real conversation it's not that where i'm coming from a place where i know it all no i'm presenting information with an understanding that i too can still learn and Alison can too still learn yes we're um, all still because learning. if we're never we're all still learning and we should be lifelong learners i, I believe Learn, learning, so is if, fun, Montres, learning is fun <laughs> Yeah, especially with you, Alison. <laughs> <laughs> Never a dull day. Hey? <laughs> Never a dull day. Viewers, Never I tell dull. you, I, I'm always calling Montrese with some kind of stupid request or question that if I can't answer, I'm pretty sure she can. And, and likewise. <laughs> likewise <laughs> i'm gonna say though that we never have stupid questions we just lack the knowledge about something so we seek it at moments of wisdom gaining there you go i like that <laughs> <laughs> you i'm gonna say enlightenment so but i don't know about that though. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear carry on my love and so let's get back to this this interview before like they'll be watching a three hour <laughs> youtube video be like wait can they just get on with the subject, please? Which really, less we can have a laugh too. So Indeed. it's all good. And so if anyone finds that the soap is um, irritating their scalp, then using um, soaps that are moisturizing or emollient based. And an emollient is a is like an oil um, ingredient designed to moisturize your skin. Um, people can also be, and we'll talk about this, we can look out for ingredients um, such as surfactants and just a little um, formulation a moment. A surfactant is a surface actant agent. So for our viewers that don't know, whenever we wash our hair, the ingredients in a shampoo bottle um, or even a body wash, yeah. the ingredient that does the washing part of it is called a surfactant. And there are some known surfactants that might irritate not just our um, skin on our body, but also our skin, our scalp skin. So such as SLS and SLES, those are um, surfactant ingredients that are quite harsh. And we should also point out those ingredients I've talked about before, because they're not just used in skincare and hair care and body care. They're also used to clean up uh, shampoo, shampoo our cars, shampoo our carpets, uh, to wash our dishes, to, to clean the dogs. They are such harsh chemicals that because they are good at cleaning, but they're also harsh on the skin. They drive the skin out, don't they? They drive the skin. Yeah. Out. So. Yeah. And I would like to add to that too. Um, they are indeed just by the makeup of what their function is. Um, and also quantity matters as yeah. well. So how much of that ingredient that's in a particular product um, is also important to consider because a so say like when we wash our, um dishes or our car there might be more of that ingredient in it versus when we wash our uh skin so yeah. they're the same because they can do a multiple different things and and the amount of that product is um sorry the amount of that ingredient is important as well so according to scientific research shampoos foams and lotions are better suited for treating the scalp now we're talking about treatments um and here are some examples of um, shampoos uh, that uh, um, that can be used to treat this dermatitis. Gels, creams and ointments are used to treat the dermatitis on the body locations other than the scalp. Um, and I searched um, an article to find this. So, And I guess I liked these aren't 100% natural, but they are not. They haven't got any nasty ingredients in them, have they? They're not necessarily natural. Yeah, however... Because when we when we go in a, into a little bit into the slide, um, the the ingredients that I'll share with you what the ingredients are called yeah. that um, are actually used, and they're not not necessarily natural. But for some people, they may be necessary depending on the severity of mm -hmm. the condition. Um, some people might need um, something a little stronger. Yeah. So I'll introduce the strong ingredients and show you examples and, and then i'll introduce some of the um the natural alternatives okay um and so 
depending on how often a person washes their hair and the severity of the condition, using a prescribed medicated shampoo or an anti-dandruff shampoo may help. And so that goes back to if it's a prescribed medicated shampoo, it will have a an ingredient in it called a pharmaceutical ingredient. And that's pharmaceutical ingredient. Okay, so it'll be natural from its source because everything really is natural and all yeah. chemicals are, are natural. And in nature, there are a lot of chemi- there's a lot of natural chemicals, but there are also mm-hmm. There are some that help and there's some that can harm us as well, right? Yeah. So all of these ingredients at one point started naturally, yeah. but they may there may have been altered it's a process. to function mm-hmm. however they need. So the process is important in how these ingredients came to be. And then, of course, formulated in, in, a, in an end product. So some medicated and anti Dandruff shampoos will contain, as I said, pharmaceutical ingredients which have properties that fight microorganisms and may help with itching and flaking. And um, these ingredients are um, such as, and I'll give you a couple of examples, ketoconazole. Now try to say that with a mouthful. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Ketoconazole, which is an active pharmaceutical ingredient that that is antifungal. So that's an example of uh, a, a medicated, in, a pharmaceutically graded medical ingredient that might be in a a prescribed shampoo. Um, its purpose is antifungal, so it's to help address the potential of the yeast that causes seborrheic dermatitis. Okay. Another example is sealimum. Sealimum. I feel like I'm saying super califragilistic I know. <laughs> they're doing well, they're doing well, the tongue twisters. They really are. So selenum is uh, an is effective as an anti infectious agent. It relieves itching and and flaking on the scalp. It also removes dry scaling scalp. So um, when even dandruff, when we start to see flakes, that's a buildup of our scalp skin. And it can be the result of um, an over, oh, I lost my train of thought, the overproduction of the keratin in our hair okay. and it's coming out of, in our scalp skin. And for those listening, what is, I'm going to get you to explain what keratin is. Keratin is a building blocks of the hair, that's it. Is it protein? It's a protein though, isn't it? So? so here we were talking about these ingredients, pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, coal tar is an ingredient that cleanses and soothes the scalp. And um, zinc Perithinol, ZP, is an ingredient that has antibacterial, antimicrobial, and antifungal properties, and it inhibits yeast. So now we talked about the pharmaceutical ingredients. Let's talk about the alternatives, which is just up our road, right? Because we're all about using uh, quality ingredients. All things Mother Nature. Woo woo straight from mother nature that has been not gone through a huge process so it's as close to its original state as possible Mm -hmm. but safe enough to be to use um on our hair on our scalp so along with the ingredients i mentioned i mentioned that some of them i mentioned properties such as antimicrobial antibacterial antimicrobial and antifungal well there are other (laughs) ingredients that have similar properties such as um, tea tree, which is an ascent, which is an essential oil, and I do um, uh, bear in. I do want to say that I understand that some people has a sensitivity to essential oils as well, mm. and so that's something to bear in mind. Um, but tea tree is is well known for being um, antibacterial. Um, there's also plant extracts such as sage um, is good for your hair. Salic acid um, is an ingredient that helps dissolve dead skin cells and then we talked earlier on about um some surfactants that were harsh even in normal people's normal people even in with people (laughs) that have that don't have medical conditions and have um their scalp isn't sensitive um those surfactants that we talked about um can also irritate our scalp yeah and so um there's a surfactant called sodium laurel lactolate. That's a, a um, ingredient that is milder than 
S L E S. Your grandson in the background. <laughs> How she, is she going to be able to take that out? That's fine. Okay. And he's all the way downstairs, right? <laughs> so you know how little our house is. He's in the living room. I'm upstairs in my bedroom. <laughs> he's got a mighty pair of lungs. Um. Um, oh, uh, also there are some oils I had to think. So some, um, not essential oils, but carrier oils, um, such as Nigella, Sacha, Inky, um, Argan oil, all of those, um, are some good oils that you could use. Um, and there are some Ayurvedic herbs also, um. And, and if the viewers are going to be like, I don't believe Montreux just did this, but this is a this is a video that's also empowering. And so I want to keep empowering and throw a challenge out to your view, viewers to go and research which Ayurvedic herbs are good mm -hmm. for this form of dermatitis. That's and, your homework. But I'm also going to point out to the viewers that you have an American accent. So what you mean, what you mean by Ayurvedic is what I could call Ayurvedic. <laughs> Oh, very good. Yes, on well, account of our different <laughs> accents, but I've got a northern accent, so it might be pronounced differently again. So yeah. there you go. Thank you. We're we're all different, and we'll, and also we'll on the screen how it's spelled anyway. <laughs> oh, there you go. And then we'll put put what you find in the comments. There we go. In Alison's video. Alrighty, and so. Um, some of these ingredients, so specifically the um, pharmaceutical good. ones, um, or even any ingredient that I mentioned today, or any ingredient. So say someone you guys have at home um, a particular product designed to help the scalp condition, and you want to understand, well, what do those ingredients on the back of that label, what, what are they? Um, this re website here is called the Coasting Database. And just a little bit of history, we talked about it earlier, but when Alison and I make products and we have, we use ingredients on our labels, we have to use the naming convention that's worldwide. It's the law yeah. and it's yeah. the it's the standard, the naming standard for all cosmetic ingredients. And so the Coasting database has a list of all of those ingredients by Inky name. Inky mm. stands for International Nomenclature of Cosmetic Ingredients. And so someone could you could you the viewers could take the one of the inky names at the back of the bottle so those long names that look really hard to pronounce and put it in the inky database and find out the function of that particular ingredient 